Hi, and welcome to the Now Spinning Magazine podcast with me, Phil Aston. And on this episode, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Gareth Ainsworth, who's best known for his incredible football career and currently being the manager of QPR. However, Gareth also has a deep passion for music. And in July, um, we will be releasing an album by his band, The Cold Blooded Hearts, which is called The Cold Light of Day. So welcome, Gareth. And I can see you're enjoying the sunshine in your garden by the look of it. Uh, for once, yeah. Um, it's it's lovely around here. And uh, thank you very much for that. And as you say, you know, uh, known for football, but hopefully uh, people do recognise that a uh, big music fan and, and music's played a huge part in my in my life, as, as everyone's life. But um, to actually try and, you know, run the two parallel in my life has been uh, has been quite testing at times, but managed to... Uh, I imagine, <laughs> yeah, I imagine it has. In fact, the whole thing runs like a an episode of Ted Lasso. <laughs> <you've> all... <laughs> in fact, this this would have fitted in as one of the in the in the recent series really well. Manager also plays in rock band. It just it just it just fits in absolutely brilliantly. Where did you your love of music? Did it come from your mom? I know because she was quite, uh, quite a singer as well, wasn't she? In her own time. Yeah, without a, without a shadow of a doubt, you know, mum was the uh, mum was the wild one, you know. So um, <laughs> back in the day, um, yeah, mum growing up uh, in in Lancashire, you know, uh, they didn't have a lot at all, and uh, I think she left school at um, fourteen, fifteen, back in the day where you could do that to go and work in in mills and factories and things like that. But she had an incredible voice, and uh, and she actually got picked up by a couple of uh, agents um, to sing on the on the big bands, you know. So oh, back wow. in yeah, so obviously you'll know Phil, but for some of your you younger listeners or viewers, that the the big bands were these, these massive orchestras that would play, um, and, the, and the whole stage was filled by musicians with this one person at the front with a microphone, and that was it. And they would they would be the focal point. And mum used to mum sang in all the uh, the Mecca Bingham Bingo halls and and the Cavern. Uh, you're lucky enough to sing it there with, with the Beatles place and um, same same venues as Dusty Springfield and people like that. They the, you know Brenda Lee big. Yeah big band singers and uh and so you know music had always been in the family and and mum would be forever singing around the house and forever going to 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 gigs it was drying up by the time me and my brother were born um so that the actual music was was from mum you know she she wanted to uh she had the rock and roll lifestyle she wanted to teach me to sing and teach my brother to sing my brother sort of was very uh resistant but uh i'm, I'm glad to say that i and I, I know when you say teach to sing, I think you're naturally born with some sort of tone or some sort of depth. Yeah, in your yeah. But then there is a technique to it, you know, as people well know. And, and, uh, and you know, there's a breathing technique. There's a way to hit high notes, low notes, everything. And, and mum taught me that from an early age. And I think she was really wanting to go in the, the footsteps. And and that was the aim. That was the that was the aim early on, you know, going into the footsteps. But um, I had a big rock and roll father as well who, who <laughs> watched uh, Hendrix at Blackpool. And, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, a big Kinks fan and, and the Who, big Who fan. Um, but also a big football fan as well. So there was uh, there was both, you know, um, modems growing up, uh, music coming at me from one stage and then sport and football, which, uh, which came down the other side. But um, no, the love of music definitely from mum and, uh, and the way she was. So one of your early bands, um, Dog Chewed the Handle, um, this is where you actually, if I've got this right, you actually hid the fact that you were pushing for a football career at the same time. And it wasn't until you were offered um, a tour of supporting Bad Manners, was it? You actually said, oh, guys, I don't think I can do this. Yeah, uh, it, it was, uh, it, it's, it's been crazy, honestly. So really early on, it was uh, it was singing in bands and pubs and clubs that were no name bands, really. We were just covering and things. And yeah. I had this dream of, of being this this rock star, but, um, the football kept getting in the way, but, um, yeah, I actually answered him. I answered him, uh, answered an advert in loop magazine. Can you believe in the early, uh, yeah, the yeah, yeah, I remember that. But, yeah. yeah. I mean, loop magazine would end, you know, advertise for singers and put, I turned up at this place, this, uh, this house with a garage converted into a studio and, uh, sang a few songs. Didn't, didn't let on who I was, not that I'm anyone special, but I was, I was playing for, Premier League and Championship clubs by then, and uh, yeah. but I kept that quiet because um, I wanted it to be on the musical talent. I always had this thing that I want people to like me for what I can do in music, rather than yeah. who I am, and maybe it'll help the music. So, yeah, I, I kept it quiet. Um, we played a, quite a few gigs around West London, and uh, 
and um yeah buster blood vessel came to one um i can't remember where it was now it was off some sort of canal somewhere i think he was living on a barge which was pretty <laughs> close to the canal and uh, he came to the club one night and uh my guitarist is a big clash fan lee Sargent. uh he's written all the songs on on the album actually and uh and he's the genius the musical genius we've, we've written a few together but um he's uh he's absolutely the uh the driving force of the music he's he's a big clash fan and uh and I think you know, uh, ska music and 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 that sort of era, the early eighties was uh, was big around then. And uh, Buster Blood Vessel, Buster Blood Vessel said to us, "Do you want to do you want to come and support Bad Manners?" And I thought, "This ain't going to work." You know, I've got a football game on Saturday. We're, we're not going to be able to go around the country with Bad Manners and uh, <laughs> and support, which was a great offer and a, a wonderful, you know, um, a bit of kudos for me. But um, unfortunately, we we never took off with that, and I had to stay. Um, yeah, I just, I just pubs and clubs, and uh, and we had the, always the ambition of getting something out. Yeah, because you formed the Cold Blooded Hearts in 2015, and Lee and Gareth have been with you since that first band, haven't they? You've been with them for what two, over two decades now. Yeah, so it's 20 years now together, me and Lee. And uh, uh, I'll have to say that Lee is uh, Lee would fit in well as a football manager. He he knows what he wants. That guy, <laughs> bloody hell, he's a uh, he's a real hard taskmaster. And, uh, and and in rehearsals, people getting things wrong or people not remembering their parts, however simple, or even me getting a lyric wrong, you know, he'd be on you. And I think that was great. I think that was really good, you know, because um, people talk about discipline in music, and that he he takes it super seriously. He's he's a you know professional musician, if if we can say that. Um, gets little bits here and there for his music but um he's uh he was the real driving force behind oh, it all. he's a he's yeah. a great player watch some um videos on youtube where you're rehearsing um yeah. they're, they're filmed in black and white and you can yeah. tell that he's got a real command of the instrument and it's a really great sound that he that he has yeah. as well yeah i mean his influences over the years are, are fantastic guitar players and and you know it, it, it's difficult because he, he he's a he's a real sort of folky guy as well where you know john mellencamp bob dylan sort of stuff and uh and he he was uh he's a genius honestly on on some of the uh on some of the you know the parts we've put together keyboards um don't even play the bass on a lot of stuff and and drum beats you know just the whole shebang lee um lucky to have him and uh and like i say he's uh he had to come over to the uh the sort of hair Hair Bear, Rock and Roll, sort of Poison, Def Leppard, Bon Jovi, Guns N' Roses, Motley Crue years that I had. Um, and and sort of, I think he he always thinks that uh, that's a strain for him to get there, you know, because he was a real sort of uh, David Bowie, flashy sort of, yeah, you yeah. know, he wasn't the, uh, the, the the hair stuff. And uh, and I think we combined quite well together. I, I, th I think you pulled him over quite well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to the new album. I mean, who were your early musical influences for yourself as a vocalist? Um, so I'll have to say that, um, the, the tone that I sing in, um, it's a real Jim Morrison sort of tone, you know, oh, that, the doors, that, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was huge for me. The doors, I got into the doors too, dad. A big influence, uh, and, and compilation CDs of rock and roll back in the day were few and far between, but, uh, rock radio and things like that, the doors kept popping up and I love the tones of Jim Morrison. I just love the music, the hypnotic sort of rock. When I, you know, people say, uh, you know, the kind of rock that I'm into, and I'll, I'll mention Motley Crue and Guns N' Roses, and they go, "Oh, you're really heavy," and I'm like, "No, these aren't heavy bands." And then The Doors is my favorite, which is a real non-heavy sort of blues yeah. rock band, you know. And 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 so Morrison's tones, Morrison's manners, Morrison's look, you know, um, who who couldn't be attracted to that, you know, uh, you know, male or female. So I was like, this guy is is, uh, you know. Uh, the, the epitome of cool and uh and I, I i sort of modeled myself on that i wanted to i wanted to be his tone be his screams be his be his sort of dynamics on stage and and that was that was really why i got into morrison in a big way you know and then like i say all, all through the 80s was probably that the 90s that you know the oliver stone film came out just reaffirming things yeah. for me how yeah, cool it's been yeah and then but then Guns N' Roses hit me hard and 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 the LA scene. Uh, I think I got into the LA scene because the Doors were LA band, you know, Venice Beach and all the stories and going over to LA and, and experiencing yeah. whiskey, the Rainbow Rooms, and then finding out about the Motley Crues, the Guns N' Roses of the world. And uh, and then I'd say that, you know, the rock of the 80s really hit me hard. And, uh, and then that opens you up to sort of the Black Crows and the Ramones and Lou Reed and stuff like that. And so all, all I was... I was hypnotized by the American stuff, I'll have to say, and uh, and that really grabbed me. So there's a couple of tracks on the album that were very 
you know, Black Rosey sort of uh, sound in Southern rock, you know, if we could say. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, that, that was really my influences. But uh, Morrison probably started it all off and Morrison was the one where I wanted to be the singer. I wanted to be that lead man. And, uh, and yeah, we'll have to say that the Lizard King uh, kicked it all off for me. Fantastic. Do you find um, that the the similarity between the adrenaline and emotions you get from playing in a in a rock band like you do, does that compare with how you how you are when you're on the pitch, whether you're playing in in a in the team or actually as a manager? Is there? Yeah, I, do you yeah. know what? I think there's there's massive similarities. You know, you're in front of a crowd, and and the moment that that ball comes to you, you know that all the eyes are on you because everyone's following the ball. That's it. You're you're on the ball. Everyone's following you, and. Maybe it's the extrovertism in me, but um, that's when you want to perform. That's when you want to be at your best, you know. So when I used to, well, when I still do, and you get on stage and you're singing in front of people, um, no matter how many people it is, their eyes are on you. And, um, you know, I think, again, back to mum, I think the performer in me, yeah, and my, yeah. daughter, my daughter seems to have it. My daughter seems to want to perform in front of anyone, you know, playing piano or singing or whatever. And I think it's it's in there because some people just hate that. Some people can't stand up in front of people. And uh, I'm, I'm the absolute opposite, you know, and, uh, you know, to the extent of, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll just I'm, I'm willing to do it in front of anyone. And, and I think that was uh, that was always always been in me from from mum again. So so you started you influenced by the doors and obviously your musical tastes have evolved as you've got older and you've gone through this and plus you in a band full of lots of different musicians. And it sounds like you've had a really good crossover in how, you know, you've got the clash and you brought, um, you know, guitarist over to more of a rock centric thing, but has your, as the way that you evolved musically, did that, has that all, did that also change your approach to football as well? You, um, well I suppose that both careers have kind of fed off each other. Yeah, I've used it, you know, uh, for I have to say I've used it. You know, anyone who says that they can't get motivated by music, they can't go to a different place with music. So um, I'm I'm not too proud to admit that, you know, when people say what what motivates you, I, I can say music sometimes, you know, listening to people, listening to the, the genius. Or, you know, people will sometimes just listen to a song and just hear a song where some people listen to a song and hear every single part and the way it's constructed, the, yeah, the yeah. lyrics and what they mean. And I think that, um, I think, I, you know, music has played a huge part in my life when I've gone through the, the, the hard times, you know, the good times are great. The good times are always brilliant, but the hard times as well, you can, it's, it's a crazy thing to say, but music's got me through some pretty, some pretty tough moments and some pretty tough times. Um, I don't know if if people will know what I'm talking about when I say that, but it, it certainly has, you know. And uh, and I think that you, when you hear lyrics, you look into them, you look into songs, you know that other people have had tough times, other people have had tough lives, and they've come through it, or they've got out of it, or they've been through this, and uh, and that's in music and in lyrics and in everything. And uh, yeah, and I, I I totally totally understand that. One of um, the taglines for for my YouTube channel is that music is the healer and the doctor. Um, and I do like a music for mental health series because I do think that it really it really does help people. My next question was going to be that have you ever used music to motivate or connect with your players at all in the football world? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. You know, we had a we 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 have a we have the uh, the the customary sort of musical jukebox in the dressing room before the games, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, now I'll have to say that back in the day as a player, I managed to rise to captain of some teams and and you could hear the dulcet tones of ACDC and, uh, and I mean, all, all that you could think of, of 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 your rock songs that would get you motivated, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. That, that sort of music was on in the dressing room. Um, over the years, I've been overpowered, I'll have to say, you know, the different genres coming out, the weaker I got in the position in the team, I and mean, especially when yeah. I had to retire. Um there's some stuff out nowadays. I couldn't even tell you what it is. You know, it sounds like one song for about an hour and uh, and I'm not yeah. even sure. That, so, but I always have the final song. So then um, I remember at QPR when I played and we played our promotion season, um, we uh, we had ACDC, You Shook Me All Night Long, you know? Yeah, yeah I know, was, very song, well. We, sang, we, we ran out to that song every single game that season. And it wasn't just the song, but it was when you heard that song come on, you knew you were in the zone to go and play a game. And everybody, no matter, you know, um, 
creed, race, colour, religion, whatever it was, when that ACDC song came on, you knew who you were at that moment and what you were buying into. And every single player bought into that song. And we went out and we got promoted at Hillsborough at Sheffield Wednesday. And, and um, even to this day, I always remember going out for that, that song that last time and saying to the boys, this is it, boys. This is the one last time. Here we go. You know, and and it brought us together so well. And, and I've always used that final song... Uh, and uh, all my success at Wickham as a manager, um, the boys will verify this. The uh, and and I can thank Jack White for Seven Nation Army because that comes on. Um, so when you hear that that bass beat, yeah, you're in work mode. You're in that mode that you're going out into that. And I've taken it to QPR as managers as well. So the song they run out to is uh, is Seven Nation Army as well, and that's uh, that kept us survived this season as well. So yeah, these moments that you hear. Um, you know, people wake up from comas after like a year when they're hearing their favorite song. You yeah. know, this is powerful stuff. And uh, and if anyone wants to dismiss it, then more fool them. I'll stay. In no, my no, I'm 100 percent behind you on that yeah, completely. Yeah. Has your has your involvement in music created like any unexpected opportunities within the world of football, or or vice versa? Do you feel it's um, my my career in football has definitely opened up some amazing opportunities in music. So. <laughs> um, being a being a friend uh, of Joe Elliott uh, is one of them, you know. So the Def Leppard lead singer who got me through my teenage years with Hysteria yeah. and Mania, you know, um, th- those albums just, I mean, fantastic, fantastic, you know, iconic moments in music. And then I end up um, exchanging emails with with Joe Elliott, and he's getting me tickets to gigs. And, and oh wow! I mean, just phenomenal. Um, I'm really lucky that um, uh, one of the, the labels that was released in is Cherry Red Records, yeah. I mean, great, great label, um, to get to know those guys really well. And again, opening up um, opening up doors for me to uh, to go to gigs, to meet people. Um, and then, I mean, one of the, the ultimates is uh, obviously Jeff Downs, the, uh, the Yes yeah. keyboarder. Yeah. He's, he's, he's he, he produced out. your album, yeah produced it and uh not only produced it he's playing on about seven songs which is uh which is absolutely incredible and when you think of who that guy is what he's achieved and for our debut album to be um to be involved in jeff downs um and to watch him actually play phil to, to go over to his studio in cardiff and uh and that was you know major half the half the recordings were over there half were done uh in, in west london but to see him play and to hear him play on the album and he's asking us, is, is that okay? And I'm thinking, oh my God, Jeff, you're Jeff Downs. <laughs> you just put whatever you want down and we'll, we'll, and we'll be happy with it. But it's just an amazing experience to see one of the, you know, one of the greatest in, 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 uh, in, in full flow. It was brilliant to see. So um, again, when you talk about opportunities, that's uh I'm on the same same record as a, 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 a as, as a legend, you know, and uh, and that's, uh, that's well, it's a it's a fantastic record as well. It's ten tracks plus the bonus track, Conspiracy of Silence, um, and it comes out uh, next month, doesn't it? Um, it's first, yeah. Because I was looking at the Cherry Red kind of press release saying it's a classic classic rock band, which is interesting. It's called that because obviously the background is kind of new wavy punk, which, which is where you came from. But it is very much a, a modern rock album. And there's some great tracks on it. Um, I think my favourite one at the moment, because I was playing it again this morning, is Broken Sky. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is that, it, that is such a hypnotic song. And you've got those female vocals at the end. And yeah. it just goes around in a circular way. But it's an in, it's a very uplifting and positive song. But the the main chorus is, Heaven doesn't have, was it a, a place for me? The devil's... Yeah, yeah. Heaven doesn't want me. Heaven doesn't want me. The yeah, devil. I mean, so what, what's, the, <laughs> what's the story so, yeah. behind that the, the song? So, yeah, I mean, Lee, Lee Lee always wants people to try and work out the story, but uh, in a nutshell, you know, the lyrics aren't hiding anything. Um, it's almost a, a you know a, a take on, um, you know, the the, uh, the the it's a relationship. It's a relationship issue where where the 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 guys obviously oh it could be the girl. But is yeah. is uh, an obviously an abusive relationship, and uh, and in the end, it just just becomes too much, and and then uh, and obviously um, people thinking that it's all their fault, and heaven doesn't want me, and the devil's put aside a place for me. But really, when you look deeper into it, it's, it's obviously the other way around. It's not your fault at all; it's somebody else's fault. But the, the hypnotic track of uh, of that, we thought 
um he's, he's very doisy you know very sort of long and 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 the repeat lines the repeat lines we we, we can see it maybe featuring in in, in a movie or something oh, yeah, like yeah, that definitely. Know, without a shadow of a doubt but um uh again the uh it definitely passes the uh, the the whistle test, doesn't it? Because it stays in your head, and you just keep repeating it and you keep singing along to it. So I've had a few people actually say, "All that's in my head is is that going round and round and round." And uh, and that was that was what we wanted to try and get. So um, now I'm pleased. I'm pleased it's uh, it's got in your head as well, Phil. <laughs> yeah, and the the other one worth waiting that I could pick up a bit of Jim Morrison in that one. Um, yeah. It's kind of Nick Cavey as well in places. Great, it's a great song. Um, what are the songs that you really liked recording? I mean, because I, I, I like them all. Um, but um, I mean, Tell Me, which is quite punky in its approach yeah. for the guitaring. But what, which songs that? I mean, are you yeah. thinking of going out live and playing any of these? Yeah, I mean, Tell Me was the first song we ever wrote together. So it's a it's a 15-year-old song, Tell Me, you know, and it's a real raw, and we could have added to it. And and I still look, listen to it sometimes thinking, could we have added some, uh, you know, a riff here and there and just fill the song out a bit? But I think part of the reason was we wanted to keep it as we first heard it and as we first wrote it, and we hope that people go on the journey with us and think, okay, that was their first song, and they've evolved to songs like, um, you know, Broken Sky. And uh, I, I love... Um, Eastern Sunrise. I think Eastern Sunrise was a lot of fun to record, you know, because we kept adding little um with little riffs and little licks. And there's a couple of there's a like an introduction symbol thing in there all the time. And and just um it was a it was honestly I couldn't pick one out worth waiting is as you say, it's my high energy song. It's my it's my it's the one that I'd probably enjoy singing the most because I'll get to jump around a little bit more than the others. And uh, and that's <laughs> that's part of the show for me, Phil. I like that. I also like Hollow, which is starts as like a, a ballad, but it's got some really powerful chords in it as well. It's really very yeah, heartfelt. Jeff, Jeff's, uh, you know, to hear that as well. And Jeff Jeff Downs plays the intro and plays the keyboards all the way through that. And the piano for me um, at the start, it gives you a feeling. It's not just the piano, you know, and I, and I, I like, um, I mean, I'm a big fan of November Rain, uh, the Guns N' Roses track, you know, and, and when you hear that piano, you get a feeling. So it's not, you can't just listen to the piano and go, oh, it's a great piano. You actually, he sets the mood and that's incredible what Jeff does. And that's, that's the kind of guy he is. He sets the mood for the song, which, you know, again, is, uh, is, is about, a, you know, a serious illness uh, and, and, you know, I think, um, you know, dementia and things like that. We've written a song about there. So it's, it's, it's a real powerful sort of thing. And Lee wanted to, to those chords to really come across and go, listen, this is not a joking matter. This is a powerful song. And, uh, and so I was, yeah, really, really pleased. So, I, I, I also think, um, cause I didn't realize that was exactly what the subject matter was about, but I think that's a, a really powerful subject and it's really good yeah. that it's covered. Yeah, we, we wanted to, and, and yeah, as I say, you know, we, we do want people to listen and, and have their own take on things and because music can mean a, yeah. a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But I know when Lee wrote that, uh, um, I remember to this day he came to rehearsal with it and he said, what do you think this song's about? And he, he played it me and sang it to me and I said, you know what, I don't know. I don't know. what, what mm -hmm. It sounds a sad song. And he went, it's a powerful song. He said, what's, what's really, really prominent today and what's getting you know a lot of press and all he said is, is you know the, the people losing people and they're still here but you've lost them because it's yeah. they don't remember you they don't know who you are and uh and so you know it's uh the, the chorus is quite you know I, I am blind to the darkness that you see you know we can't see we can't feel yeah. what the person's feeling you know and bring you back home you know we're trying to bring these people back home and um so yeah real Hair standing on your arms moments, but um, hopefully people appreciate what the I, song's about. I think they will. And I think I actually think that the song will bring people a lot of comfort. And as we said earlier, how powerful music is in helping to heal or to come to terms with things. I think, you know, a lot of those songs and uh, now in Broken Sky, I did think it was about that. It's got kind of a St Steve Earl kind of a <laughs> yeah. theme as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and but, but that really works. I also like um, Grey, which is the track before that. Um, that's a great song. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, again, you know, topical, topical, very topical at the moment. You know, with um, you know the teenagers of today and 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 the the, the things they go through. And uh, and I think that you know it was about when we were younger, and uh, we probably didn't have the uh, the support and the uh, you know what's it called the press all about it. And you know, people are now a lot more aware of uh, 
with issues, mental health issues, things like that. And I think we, we've got to try and just bring, you know, we, we're, we are a rock and roll band, but you've got to write your songs about something. And we, we want to try and get messages out there that are important to people as well as the good music. But so I, th- I suppose this puts you in a, a very good position because you're a, you're an inspiration for people from what you do in your football career, um, you know, from how you, you know, how people see you and you're perceived through the media, et cetera, but also through music. It will sh- it shows a different because through music you can express yourself in a different way. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I can say yeah. things in music and 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 sing things or, or you know that that I can't do in football. I think that's that's really important. That um, I think the most important thing for was that as a band, we we never wanted the football to drive the music. We always wanted to be recognised. Musically, you know, uh, that's a big, yeah. thing, especially for Lee, who's worked all his life on stuff like this, and uh, and so, um, you know, I'm hoping that people will go, oh, yeah, this is a great song. It's that, that you know, we, we do know that our guy plays football, but this this is this is musically, we, we like this as well. You know, it's not just because I'm associated with something else, but um, if I can be an inspiration to anyone with any of our songs, with any of our messages, or like I said earlier in the interview, you know, music can change moods, it can change lives, it can change anything. Um, and if we can change anything with our music, maybe it's just making people feel good, then it's all been worthwhile. Well, the album's full of hope. I mean, the opening track, um, High, that's very uplifting and feels like it's a song about life lessons and, you know, and some great yeah. guitar playing guitar yeah. playing as well as vocals in that. Yeah, I mean, Lee, uh, like you say, on the solos, um, He's uh he's definitely got a unique sound, you know. He he definitely goes off on his solos on his own. And I'd, I'd, I'd love people to listen to these solos and and you know, um, certain guitarists have their own sound when they solo. They really do. You know who's you know you know when Slash is solo and you know yeah, what yeah. that is, you know. Uh, and and I'm hoping that Lee, um, you know, it'll take some time, but get recognised and go. You know what? Yeah, he plays very similar solos all the time because it's signature. It's his it's his way. Um, but you know, to be in the presence of like him and Jeff and when they're writing these solos together and, and when Lee comes up with one and says, What do you think of this? I'm just I'm just blown away sometimes. So I hope he really gets the uh the recognition he deserves because he works so hard. Well, and also I think uh say I'll mention Lee again here at this point. I think that his his solo served the song. It's yes, everything yeah, everything fit, everything fits in like a like a team. Yeah, it's, and and, no and one's going off on their own thing, yeah. saying, "Oh, this is my moment." Yeah, and I think that's important. That you see that in old bands, all successful bands, you know, work as a team, no matter what they are, and uh, the team can some sometimes get fractured down the line. I, I, I we've we've all <laughs> we've heard plenty of stories of that, but um, right at this moment, we're working together really well. And and as you say, um, the solos really do serve the song. Lee knows how to write a song. He knows knows what to do. He's been doing it for years, and uh, it's a yeah pleasure to work with him on this. So. Obviously, with your very busy life that you have, are you are there any plans to to play any gigs to to promote this album or or video broadcast or anything? Oh yeah, we're 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 actually we're, I mean we've got one or two uh, appearances at places. I think we're at Rough Trade on the night of the opening, uh, the night of the release. We're in Rough Trade in East London, so oh, again, even if it's a, an acoustic set of these or some feel about the songs, we can do that. Um, uh, you know, again, my football career does uh, does um, really scupper this band's chances of going on a world tour if we ever got that big. But um, believe me, I'd love the decision to make. Um, we uh, we'll try and get a few gigs um, locally around West London if if possible, um, just to promote the album. But you know, we're hoping, as we say, that the promotions that people are giving us will uh, will just whet the appetite a little bit. And if people can get used to listening to these songs, get them on the radio, we'll uh, we'll be more than happy. And how do you see your your involvement with music? How you've got to this point? This is your um, the first album that's coming out through Cherry Red Records. How do you kind of see evolving alongside your football career? Do you see that this is is this exactly what you would have liked to have seen the way it's gone? Yeah, I think so. I think um, the the ambition Phil was always to go into music and and become a full time musician after football. Um, that got sidetracked when I became a football manager and I started extending this crazy life in this crazy game. And uh, I love it. And uh, and football, obviously, is a big love of mine. I've, I've been lucky enough to manage over 600 games now and played nearly 700, you know. So 
um, there's big affiliation to the sport that's uh, probably enabled me to do a lot of what I've done. But I've always answered the question whether it's, uh, you know, David Beckham or Mick Jagger's life. There's only one winner there for me. And uh, and I'd still be on tour with the Rolling Stones right now. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant answer. And the album it comes out, it's available on vinyl, CD, download and to stream, isn't it? The full whack, yeah. We wanted to make sure that that was important because, uh, you know, vinyls, Vinyl was so important to us growing up. And listen, yeah, band of uh, it's a band of of guys of uh, I think there's one of us under forty, and the rest of us are over forty. So uh, vinyl played a huge part in our lives, and there's no way we're going to shy away from that. <laughs> well, brilliant. Well, thanks very much. It's a fantastic album, everybody, and it's called it's by the Cold Blooded Hearts, and it's called The Cold Light of Day, and it's absolutely wonderful album, very uplifting, um, and and as I say, covering lots of issues that all of us uh, live, live through at various times in our life both good and bad so um thanks very much gareth that's been really really great talking to you it's been great to meet you phil and thank you so much as i say you know it's uh it's awesome awesome hopefully the album can do well but if not at least i've still got an album out there i'm really pleased and, and it's available from cherry uh, cherry red and all major online Very outlets. And, and all the uh, all the downloads uh, all the all the normal all the normal sort of avenues of uh, of download but um cherry red um they're back to so go to cherry red and get it off them yeah <laughs> well, fantastic and thanks very much and uh good luck with it and hopefully i'll talk to you again in the future absolutely thank you very much phil appreciate thank it you. thanks very much so thank you for tuning in and a big thank you to my special guest gareth ainsworth and remember to check out his album on cherry red records by the cold bloodied hearts a cold light of day it's absolutely fantastic and i'm sure you'll all love it remember to check out the website now spinning magazine at nowspinning.co.uk check us out on youtube and social media on twitter instagram linkedin and facebook and subscribe to the podcast as well and join us on patreon if you'd like to support us further take care remember music is the healer and the doctor and i shall see you very very soon <laughs>